Anyway, uh, single lung transplantation, I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk about it. Uh, <clears throat> un unlike uh, uh, Brian's experience at WashU, where they have a huge volume of transplants, we, we don't have that same volume. So a lot of what I have to say draws from the historical experience of the uh, Toronto and, and WashU groups <clears throat> and the, uh, the registry data itself. Um, <clears throat> for, uh, uh, I think, a lot of us, we can remember what it was like uh, with the first description of uh, isolated lung transplantation in the early 1980s. After uh, a few decades and scores of transplants that had uh, failed, the Toronto group was able to present this very dramatic uh, uh, result consistently uh, with survival and uh, good functional outcomes for uh, single lung transplantation. And they achieved uh, that really with uh, some very diligent uh, laboratory work and applying good general thoracic surgical principles, the kinds of things we apply for our patients uh, every day. In addition to uh, being quite uh, shrewd, if you will, in terms of selecting the right kind of patients and judicious use of immunosuppression, this of course was right around the time of the, uh, the first uh, employment of the interleukin-2, or <coughs> excuse me, the calcineurin inhibitors. In any event, uh, with uh, pulmonary fibrosis giving favorable ventilation and perfusion, uh, they were able to show uh, quite uh, reproducible results. And subsequently, their experience demonstrated really all of these remarkable things. And it's, uh, it's something to think back uh, uh, on that time 25 years or so ago uh, when all of this was really quite shiny and new and, and very fascinating. The dramatic uh, uh, correction of ventilation and perfusion abnormalities, the, uh, the really uh, previously unappreciated change in conformation of the chest wall and the diaphragm. As I'm sure you're all aware, the patients, uh, certainly the patients with emphysema, but even the patients with pulmonary fibrosis seem to be quite fixed and rigid, and there's a whole history, as you know, of, of uh, changing the chest wall or changing the diaphragm. Uh, and in fact, it turns, that the, turns out that those are relatively passive structures, and it was the experience with single lung transplantation that, that demonstrated that to us. And then a variety of technical modifications that proceeded over the, uh, the subsequent uh, five to ten years, <clears throat> removing some of the, uh, the absolutes, if you will, that uh, supposedly led to the success in Toronto, including the removal of the omental, f the omental uh, flap. Um, this just underscores the idea with single lung transplantation, you get this dramatic uh, perfusion, uh, 85, 90 percent perfusion to the uh, lung graft that only increases over time. Uh, and then these uh, conformational changes here uh, in 1989, uh, the, uh, the French group, uh, Andreasen and others, uh, demonstrated the capability to take a, a patient like that with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and implant a right lung in this very dramatic change in diaphragm and change in conformation of the chest wall in addition to the favorable perfusion on that side resulted in a, in a dramatic uh, physiologic benefit. So that it was clear that putting in a single lung dramatically decreased uh, pulmonary artery pressures. And then something else that was learned along the way was the fact that the right ventricle was much more malleable than we appreciated. That in fact the right ventricle had the capability to recover its uh, systolic function and its diastolic uh, dysfunction when you lowered uh, pulmonary artery afterload. And obviously that uh, the VQ matching which was or should be perfect in the uh, lung graft uh, went a long way towards improving the functional capacity of the patients. <clears throat> the improvement in respiratory mechanics I mentioned and the removal of any muco or microbial burden was there as well. Um, developments further continued and the, uh, the Kent Trinkles group uh, uh, demonstrated that this telescoped anastomosis, so to speak, uh, was a significant step forward and then sort of standardization of the implantation procedure on one side and as uh, Brian mentioned in terms of uh, bringing that to uh, bilateral lung transplantation as well. And I think uh, one of the things that, uh, that we also uh, tend to overlook because it's so ubiquitous right now is, again, a, a seminal contribution by the group in Toronto, and that's the low potassium dextran solution, which really has dramatically changed, I think, the incidence of uh, acute graft dysfunction and uh, preservation of the lungs, and then the appreciation that the lung should be well inflated and that reperfusion should uh, be performed with the lung inflated in a very controlled fashion. Uh, all of these led to, to uh, uh, consistent improvements uh, in outcomes over time. So that 15 years after that initial description, uh, single lung transplantation was a pretty straightforward process. You could 
pretty much expect when you might be troubled by acute rejection or airway complications, um, uh, when you would have to worry about a, a, a bliter to bronchiolitis as the long-term major difficulty, and even infectious complications could be plotted out um, uh, pretty clearly. So that uh, in around 2000 or so is pretty clear, single lung transplantation. That's what you wanted to use for pulmonary fibrosis, for COPD, for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency patients, sarcoidosis, and occasionally for retransplantation. And when one looked at the distribution of transplants there, uh, almost 60% of them were for either alpha-1 or COPD, and then uh, uh, the sarcoid patients are in here and the IPF patients here. So clearly a, a, pretty, uh, a pretty useful uh, procedure. And it, uh, it turned out that there were a pretty consistent number of single lung transplants done up through uh, the 2000, again, the, looking at the registry data. But the, the big bugaboo here was the donor availability, and, and that is, as Brian was alluding to, the idea that, uh, that either one person is lucky or two people are not quite so lucky. And, uh, and there clearly was and still is a donor shortage. Uh, only a, a, a fraction of the patients who are brain dead donors uh, can be lung donors, at least as, as far as we know. And up until that time, allocation was according to waiting time on the list, not to acuity uh, of the uh, recipient themselves. And it was, as I've already shown, uh, the clear physiologic benefit um, in the fibrotic, the native lung patients, the recipients for single lungs, the native lung became progressively more functionless, if you will, and in the COPD patients, it was clear the new lung graft, the single lung graft, could uh, ventilate and uh, provide uh, relief for the patients. But there were some contrarian viewpoints. Uh, Brian's touched on uh, one of them from the WashU group and, and the other from the, uh, the initial uh, view of the uh, folks at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Clearly, as uh, more transplants were done, the specter of bronchiolitis obliterans uh, raised its uh, ugly head, and certainly it's, it seems uh, intuitive, more lung tissue, greater reserve to tolerate something that seemed relatively uh, recalcitrant to, in terms of treating it. There was this idea of, of uh, 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 justice, uh, if you will, younger patients, particularly innocent ones with uh, emphysematous lung disease from alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, more deserving for organs. And it was also clear that in larger volume programs with greater organ availability, it was less of a critical issue to try to get, uh, get lungs to be available. And so the, the initial thought was that, well, young patients, particularly patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, should get double lungs and other people should get single lungs. But we're fast forwarding here now to the registry report from last year. And what you begin to see and fairly consistently can see is that, that uh, in the alpha-1 patients, there's clearly an advantage, just as was assumed 10 years ago, uh, for double lung transplantation as compared to single lung transplantation. And if you look at that according to age stratification, again, still in the alpha-1 group, you still see that advantage. So uh, even for the uh, single lung patients, <clears throat> there's a disadvantage, if you will, here uh, to their uh, to, to getting a, uh, uh, excuse me, to the alpha-1 patients, the disadvantage of a single lung transplant. Similarly, and more dramatically, you can see a difference in the long-term survival here uh, for the patients with uh, uh, COPD, standard COPD. And I think the, uh, the mechanisms of why patients have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency-related emphysema versus the patients who have garden variety of COPD, for instance, might account for some of these uh, differences overall. And again, if you look at the, uh, uh, the differences between the uh, double lung group here and the single lung group, again, for COPD, non-alpha-1 uh, patients, you can see a, a, an overall difference here in long-term survival in this group. And when you even look at the uh, pulmonary fibrosis groups, again, with the registry data, you can see this uh, difference in survival as time uh, goes out here. So there is, there is something going on and there is a reason to, uh, to think about double lung transplantation over single lung transplantation. And certainly in the pulmonary hypertension people, uh, that's the case as well. And when you look again at the registry data, you can see that the large programs are clearly voting with their feet here, that the, uh, the number of uh, double lung transplants has gone up dramatically, uh, ignoring the PPH patients, gone up dramatically for all of these indications over the last uh, five years, uh, five to eight years. And uh, I think we're going to see more of that over time, uh, not because of revenue-based arguments, I think, but because the outcomes uh, certainly seem better. So I would 